about that. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Maybe it's been a little while since you've been in Genesis. You forgot about some things in Genesis, but uh, I'm going to share some things with you this morning. I believe that is maybe a good reminder. Things would be easy to forget. We get to go on sometimes in life. We get busy with stuff that's happening all around us. And I think sometimes it's very easy to forget the purpose that we're, what, what we're supposed to be doing and the things that uh, are a representation of God. Genesis chapter 1, I want to jump around here just a little bit because the entire chapter, frankly, is about creation. Um, how many of you believe in creation? That's about a third of you. How many of you, how, the rest of you, I'm going to make the assumption that you believe in the Big Bang Theory. How many of you believes in the Big Bang Theory? How many of you don't, ain't going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Genesis chapter 1, I want to jump through here a little bit. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Chapter uh, verse 10, God called the dry land earth and gathering together the waters called he the seas and God saw that it was good. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its own kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good. Y'all start to see a, a pattern here. Verse 18, and the rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. Thank you very much. Help me just a little bit. Get me warmed up. Let me get warmed up. So you got to help me get warmed up, right? So he says uh, in verse 21, God created great whales and every living creature and that moves which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. Thank you very much. Verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind. Everything uh, that creeps upon the earth and after his kind and God saw that it was good. Verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made and behold... It was very good. very good. I like that. So God goes through all this time of creation. He goes through this period, and he's creating everything, the earth, the light, the moon, the stars, everything about our existence, people themselves, animals. He's making all these things, creating all these things. After each time, notice he always said, and he looks back, he reflects back, and he goes, and God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. Even to the very last, on the last day, God looks back and he goes, and God saw that it was very good. Not just good, but very good. So we take that word for granted sometimes. What does that mean? What does the word good mean? So I, I looked it up. And I thought, let's get a better indication, a better uh, uh, idea of what God was trying to say based upon the Strong's Concordance looking back to the, uh, to the original Hebrew as to what the word good means. And it, and it means this. It means beautiful, cheerful, at ease, pleasant, pleasure, precious, prosperity, and sweet. So when God's looking back on that, it's like, you know, we use the word Sometimes, uh, man, if somebody get a new car and they go, that is one sweet ride, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Well, what, to, what are they saying? Man, that is good. That's a good, good-looking ride right there. That's a sweet ride. So that's really in context when somebody says sweet because that's really what they're saying. They're really saying good. It's good. So God is saying all these things that he created good. You know, it's interesting. I don't know. Did you all hear about this guy? I, I don't know his name. I've never heard of him, but it was a Christian artist. Recently, I, I saw on Facebook that um, this Christian artist who was a PK, uh, a preacher's kid growing up, 
he comes out and he says that he has now determined he's a, I mean he's a Christian artist singing Christian music and he's now determined he's come to the conclusion that he does not believe in God I'm like okay let me get this straight so you're a preacher's kid you've been raised in 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 church obviously and you've been raised uh, about the things of the gospel and you've been singing about Christian music and you get to the place you come to the conclusion yeah you know what I don't think there is any God now it's one thing it's one thing if you get to a conclusion you go you know I'm just not sure about Jesus because that's not necessarily referencing creation per se because everybody has to determine within that moment I mean almost I won't say everybody but many the majority of people do believe in God they just see different versions of God okay but it's another thing when you say I don't believe in God so in other words I guess you have to say that you subscribe to the theory the idea of the Big Bang in other words just so happen to be things floating around the air well how they were how were they floating how did they how were the the masses that come together that slam together and created a beautiful you know earth it's like I I've shared with you before did you ever notice if you'd like to have uh, you know maybe you want you uh, a, a, a Cadillac or a Lexus or a Lincoln do you know you usually don't go to the junkyard do you you don't go where they've had wrecks and crashes where they slam together and go man look at that that is one beautiful sweet ride what you do is you go to the car dealer and where, where did the car come from it came from a manufacturing plant where somebody took great care and great time and effort they shined it they put the right paint on it and they made it look good to where you looked at it you go whoo that is one sweet ride right notice it wasn't a big you know collision it just all of a sudden created this beautiful earth all of a sudden it just perfectly round hangs in the middle of nothing stars all around the moon just the perfect distance from the sun so that you don't burn up or freeze to death just everything is just right and it just happened to be like that I'm like you have to be an idiot to believe that there is no God now just you know you say did he just say that church I most certainly did you have to be dumb to believe that there's no God look around and see this and that's what God was doing he's looking at it and he's like man this is good 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 everything about God comes back to good everything about him whether it's his creation his intentions everything that he does everything that he thinks the being of who he is everything about God is good and then somebody comes along and says I don't even believe there's a God I'm like you're a dummy you're just dumb amen thank you very much for that support I mean come on I mean even if you subscribe to the fact that a collision could create something beautiful even if you believe that where did where did the mass come from wouldn't it just be a space of nothingness well how did it turn how did it how did it be well we we were formed out of amoebas and then they formed into something else and something else and something else well where did it come from where did the beginning come from it's like come on man come on use your brain that God that God gave you good night so we're looking around and we have to ask ourselves so God is all good everything that he does is good every thought that he has is good everything so then he creates me and you now there are times that I've questioned God and I said God was you sure about him was you completely sure about her because man oh man I, did you know this was going to actually that they were going to end up like that and then watch this watch this so you know what's been going on right in the news if you watch any at all I mean you have to see that you know there's a, a police officer that that I believe personally I believe was total uh, just just murder I believe he just killed a man that's just all there was to it 
Aren't you saying, well, man, did God know how, that, that that guy was going to do that? And then, and, then, and then what comes from that is riots and people. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking for me, personally. Watch people uh, burn buildings down and, and, and break windows and doors and go in and rob and steal places and, and do it in the name of somebody's death. I, think, I find that appalling. Uh, it's, it's terrible. And to watch all this, and you see, I mean, how many of you, how many people would say that's really good? That was really good that that, that officer killed that man. Nobody, nobody. If I, I'm like, kind of was like, hey, for the first time in a long time, I think like the entire United States would could get behind and say that is obvi- was obviously wrong, and and could get behind the support of recognizing that that there needed to be some, uh, you know some things happened from that but that was short lived but we would say would we say that that's good of course not we'd look at it and go that's, that's an evil act and then to watch people burn buildings down and in their community and we, we, could you say that's good good that building needed to be burned down good that business owner needed to be, out, be put out of business could we say that no, but then you'd say, well, why did God create that? Because he knew that was going to happen, right? Why would he create such a man that would kill another man? It's because that everybody that, was, that has been created has innately inside them the ability to be good. It doesn't matter who they are. I mean, the most heinous people on the planet, I mean, some of the most terrible people that we recognize had the ability to be good. You take a man like that Adolf Hitler, who is a, a stain on humanity, right? And you could name, there's many others, just using him, but there, he's a stain on humanity to see what, what, what he did to humanity. But inside him was the ability to be good. There was something in him because God created him. There was a capability within him. He just chose to resist and people, that's what people are doing. They just choose to resist the peace of God. They choose to resist the presence of God. They choose to resist what they know to be right. You, listen, let me just, let me be clear. I'm telling you right now, I don't know any of these people, okay? But I'm telling you right now, that officer that was doing that, inside him, deep down, you have to might peel back a couple of layers, but he knew what he was doing was wrong. You cannot convince me that he didn't know better. You cannot convince me that when people are taking and stealing things out of businesses and setting businesses on fire, you cannot tell me that they deep down do not know that's wrong. They all know it's wrong. They just resist. They resist the presence of God because God is trying to speak to each and every one of them and say, this is not right. The Holy Spirit is capable and able of speaking to people, and He does. They just resist or they've gotten to the place to where they're calloused and they refuse to hear. It doesn't mean it isn't being said, and it doesn't mean that, it, that God isn't trying. But you say, well, so God is always good. Well, what is our place in this? Well, God created us, so we each and every one of us have a specific purpose in life and a call. So, so what is that, that call? Now, I'm, I'm not here to get into individualism as far as what your individual calls are because different people have different things and you're anointed different ways. Many of you are totally anointed different ways than I'm anointed and I'm anointed different ways than you're anointed. And, so the, and that's right. But the one general call that each and every one of us has is the same. And I want to share just a little bit about this uh, with you today. Uh, the call that each and every one of us has is to preach the gospel. You say, well, I'm not called to be a preacher. Of course you are. Most definitely you are. It's just a different way. You might not stand behind a podium. You might not do, you know, put together a church. You might not do that, but you all, you're all are called to share the good news, to proclaim. The preach just means proclaim. Some people do it more as a, as a, as a, from a church setting or, or a profession, different things like that. But we're all called to proclaim the gospel. Now, what does the gospel mean? But yes, the good news, but, but good news about what? See, we, we, we get in a, in, in a kind of a hole sometimes, and we just get this idea, yeah, we preach the gospel, and we forget what the gospel really means. We forget what that means. If we're going to represent God, then it's going to have to be from the perspective of good, something good. 
And sometimes we try to shame people into things. We try to, to you know, convince them, manipulate them. But the reality of it is, is that not, doesn't really represent God. What represents God is to be like Him. You know, you, sometimes people might ask the question, what, I wonder what God is really like. He's like you, minus the sin and the perversion. Did he say that? He's like you, minus the sin and the perversion. If you can imagine what God looks like, how do you know that? How do I know that? Well, the Bible said that you've been created in His image after His likeness. So there is an ability on the inside of us to be at least more like God. And if we want to have an impact upon society and upon the world for the Lord Jesus then we're going to have to be more and look a little bit more like what God looks like. If you'll notice back when creation happened, do you notice that the animals when they were created, do you notice none of them were ripping each other apart? There wasn't any chickens getting their heads wrung off because they wanted a chicken meal, chicken dinner, right? None of that was going on. That only happened after the fall. Y'all ever wrung a chicken's neck? How many's wrung a chicken's neck? Raise your hand. There's a few. I have. My grandmother, you know, she used to. They, we was raised on a farm, and and uh, they, she used to have a bunch of chickens. And uh, you know, any night that she's having uh, making fried chicken, she'd go out there and get one of the chickens, and you know, wring that neck off. Boom. And, uh, you know, you ever heard the expression, run around like a chicken with its head cut off? Well, that is true, if you've never seen it. <laughs> you wring a chicken's head, cut it off, woo! It'll run around for a little while with no head. So if you ever you was wondering where that expression came, it is real. But that stuff wasn't happening before, before the fall. So God wants us to preach about something that's good that represents him and to share with the rest of the world what it is that they need to see. There was no sickness, no disease, there was no poverty, there was no lack when God created man. Notice that if God wanted something good, notice he didn't say, and on, this, on the sixth day, God created coronavirus so that he could make sure that people would stay humble. <laughs> Do you notice there was none of that? Sickness and disease only came after the fall. Notice that God didn't say, in order to keep the people humble, on the fifth day, he created lack and poverty so that they could understand that, you know, don't look too much to, the, to, to, to be blessed. Don't think you can be too blessed. No, he didn't do that. He, 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 like, really blessed them because he wanted them to be able to have everything that the heart of what is good. When you're talking about raising your kids, do you want them to do without do you, you think sometimes, man, I'll tell you what, I love my kids so much, I just would like to see them go hungry for three days because it'll really help them. You don't think that way because you love them and you want what's good for them. And the Bible says that God even references, he says, how many of you that, would, that if, your, if your son or your daughter asked for bread, that you'd give them a stone? Or if, if they asked for a fish, that you'd give them a serpent? He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, will the, the Father of, and the Creator of everything give good gifts to them who ask Him? Now notice he said what? What kind of gifts? Good gifts. Good gifts. The things that, that, that we need in life. The things that, that we count on. He, he's all about good. Everything that God does is good. And then he expects us to be a direct representation of what he looks like. He wants us to be the same way that he is. To look the same. To act the same. To be the same kind of personality as much as that's possible. He says in verse, uh, Psalms 119, verse 68, the writer of Psalms here says, Thou, talking about God, he says, Thou, you are good and you do good notice he didn't say you, you do a lot of good you do some good and then he tells us in Matthew chapter 12 verse 33 to either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt now notice the, differenti the differential between good and then what does he say he says corrupt that means dishonest wrong 
bad, evil. And so he's talking about good. And if the tree is good, what would you think comes from the tree? If it's a good tree, what can you expect to see? Good fruit. If it is a corrupt tree, then you expect to see corrupt fruit because that's what it is. That's what comes out of its roots. He says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? He says, when you're following after the heart of darkness, how, how is it that you can speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Now, God is saying that you have to decide what kind of person do you want to be. Do you want to be one that produces evil? Do you want to be one that produces good? Do you want to be a corrupt person? Do you want to be a good person? Because good is what draws people to God. I don't care what everybody says. Sometimes I know it's the, it's just, it, it, it kind of has came with, with, sometimes we adopt traditions, and many traditions are good and some are not. And that tradition of trying to, we try to scare people, you know. I have been in services where you, people would try to scare people into their salvation. And the problem with that is it just doesn't work. It doesn't take. Because people usually, when they, when they get unscared, they run from God. That's why he tells us, don't you understand that it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance? In other words, he knows that if you don't come to a place of recognize that he, recognizing that he's good, it won't mean anything to you to turn away from what you, one place where you're at to another place. You have to recognize, wait, I'm turning from this, and I'm turning to that. And if I turn to something, it has to be a, a it has to be bait, so to speak. God's bait is his goodness. You know, when you go fishing, you throw out a certain kind of bait and a certain kind of lure. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not a fisherman. We went out, we had a, like a little church fishing trip. Now, Dave and Chris, they were like eating it up. Marco's out there. They're all trying to catch, and they're reeling in, the, you know, the fish. And, and I've got one out there, and I, I think I did catch one. I got one. But I just, I mean, I, I, say what you want. I mean, I don't care to work, do anything. But I, there's just something about sticking the hook in a worm. I'm like, man, what did the worm ever do that was so bad? Why does he have to die? Why does that worm have to die? I mean, in order, I, 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 I'm just, you know, I, as growing up, you know, I'm, I'm lived on, I lived on a farm, and, and they'd take, you know, my dad, grandfather, they'd always go hunting, different things like that, and, and cousins and so forth, and they'd go hunting, and uh, hunting, you know, because you're from Sandy Hook, hunting, not hunting, hunting, and, uh, and squirrel hunting or deer hunting, you know. And, and even then, it kind of rubbed me a little bit the wrong way, but as I got older in life, I was like, man, I don't, I don't want to see anything die. If I can keep from it, and I don't have to kill it, I don't want to have to kill it. You ever see those little uh, uh, things in your shower? Sometimes you get in the shower, and they, they, they've got like all kinds of legs, and, and uh, not a spider. What do they call them? It, no, not a grand day long leg, but those two. I, I, somebody told me one time, it's kind of like a spider, but they call them something else, spider something. But anyway, so they're in there, and I'm like, ugh. And, and so you have to make the decision, does he die right then? Yes. He, most, most people say yes. You know what I usually end up doing? I go find a little box, get him into the box, take him outside, and turn him loose. Because I'm like, there, if he can live, there's, he's not, I mean, he interrupted me a little bit. But if, if I can do it, now there's a few times where I'm like, dude, I have no time for you today. You, you have, you know, you got in my space, you're trespassing, you got to go. Every now and then, but usually I even feel kind of guilty over that. So I try to not, I just, you know, try to not kill anything because I believe in life as much as possible. And so uh, I have no idea how I got off on all that, but, <laughs> but, but anyway, so Psalms 34, Psalms 34. Anybody know where I was going with that? Psalms 34, verse 8. Oh, bait, bait, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Susan. Yes, so bait. What did the worm ever do? He's just trying to survive. And you hook him, and you know he's dead, and, and he's, you know, or, or he's suffering too, even to beat it all. And throwing him out there and then catch fish. So, but the point is, is God's bait. 
Thank you. God's bait is his goodness. That's the attraction. That's what God knows attracts people. He like knows, first of all, what he's after, which is people. And he knows what catches them, what draws them to him is when they see his goodness. And so that's why he wants us to represent him that way. He doesn't want us to wrongly represent him. He wants us to, to represent him in a way where people are attracted. They look and they go, what's, what's going on in your life? Well, God is good in my life. You know, listening to some of Brian's testimony, Brian Ash's testimony, he's going to share a little bit of that next, next week. Um, I mean, it's like that's what, that's what people want to hear, Brian. People want to know that you serve a God that's good. They don't want to serve, they don't want to know about a God that you serve that you're afraid of, that you're in fear of. Do you know you're, you can't even have faith in God if you don't believe that he's good? Seriously, think about it. Can you have faith in a God that you're afraid of or that you're unsure about, that you don't know if he's good or not? I submit to you, you can't. You can only have faith in God knowing that he's a good God, knowing that he's going to respond and be a blessing and help you. So Psalms 34, verse 8, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed is the man that trusts in him. He says taste. So that means this, that each and every person on the planet has to see for themselves. You can't just do it for them. You can lead them, you can throw the bait out, but they have to taste and see for themselves. And when they taste and see that the Lord is good and that he wants to bless them, he wants to help them, he, he, he cares about them. And I'm going to talk just in a minute about what does that exactly mean? Because what is good? God is good, but I need more, I want, I want to be more specific. What does that mean? What does that look like? What, what is the representation? If we were describing something good, what does that mean? So we're going to look at that in, in just a minute. So God is interested in making sure that people understand that he's a good God. God doesn't make people sick. He doesn't make people poor. In fact, about it, I love this verse in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 in the Amplified Bible. I love this, the way this reads. It says, and this is the message, the message of promise which we have heard from him and now are reporting to you. So now they're reporting something about God, right? Let me read that one more time. And this is the message, the message of promise, which we have heard from him, and now we're reporting to you. So they're proclaiming the gospel. So they're getting ready to proclaim some good news. Just like me and you should be proclaiming this message. God is light. Here's the message. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. What's this? No, not in any way. I love that translation of that verse. He doesn't just say there's no darkness in God. He says there's, God is light. There is no darkness in him. Not at all. No, not in any way. Not any part. There's no darkness in God. It's only a representation of something that's good. Dark is evil. Light is good, right? So when there's no darkness, there's no evil, it's all good with God. And when we see God from that perspective, from that viewpoint, it's like we can know then, wait, he's a God that can be trusted. I, I know sometimes you don't understand. You say, well, how in the world can some of these, ha these things happen? Because there's a devil loose. There's a devil loose still in the planet and still wants to rob you of your faith. He wants to rob you of your life. If he could take you out, he would. He tries every day. He wants to see you die. He wants to see you broke. He wants to see you sick. He wants to see you turn against God to where you go, I just don't understand why, and do like this nutty uh, Christian artist, of which I was actually, didn't mean to get off on him so much, but uh, I was actually equally appalled that some other Christian artist, the people that you would have heard of, was actually saying, hey, brother, it's okay. Anytime you want to chat, we're, we're available to talk. I'd be saying, you are a moron. <laughs> what is wrong with you? What have you lost? What, what do you not? How, how did you come to this conclusion? I don't know. Maybe, 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 they, maybe they'll help him. But how do you get to the place to where you, you, that, that changes you so drastically? How, how do you change to think that somehow or another is no God? Well, he's lost sight of what's good. Because after all, how, does, how did good exist? Did it just happen? Did good things happen? Does morals? You know, if, if we didn't have a society that taught 
and preached and shared about God, can you imagine, we talked about it last week, a life with no God. What would that be like if there was no God, no, nothing of which to repress evil from at all? What would it look like? Would it be a chaotic world? Would it be a world to where you, there's no love? We talked about all the different things. There's no love. There's no compassion. There's no forgiveness. There's no anything that's good. In fact, good is totally removed from the equation in the whole world, everything. It doesn't matter whether you're married, even if you could get married, because marriage usually symbolizes the fact that you love somebody. So if you did be getting married, it'd only be for a matter of convenience. Like, well, they can do something for me that I can't do for myself. And they're going to help me. And then the other person would feel the same way. And then what we said last week, a, a, uh, what is normally a lovemaking uh, you know, time would turn into nothing other than just a, uh, uh, a sexual encounter. Would be no love in it. I mean, you're talking about like a messed up world. And it's like, to some degree, isn't that kind of what we're starting to see? That's why that we need more of God. We need to represent Him appropriately and, and, and correctly and accurately. And that is to show that He's a good God. That He wants to help. He wants to change things. He wants to lead people back to Him. So that they see Him. So there's no darkness in him, no, not in any way. Romans 10, chapter 16 says, But they have all not obeyed the gospel or the good news. For Isaiah said to the Lord, uh, saith, Lord, who has believed our report? So not everybody believes the report of the Lord. Not everybody believes that God is good. If you get a bad report, the Bible has an answer for every bad report that you get with a good report. The question is, is a matter of do you receive the good report? And I would even say this, if you're looking for God, if somebody goes, man, I've been, I've been, seeking, I've been seeking God and I just haven't found him, then you're not looking in the right place. And you're not looking for the right thing. Look for something that's good and you will begin to find God. Look for what is good in the world and you'll find God because you'll find that he's the one behind the good. And if you want to look and find out where the enemy is, you find out where evil is taking place and evil things that are happening, and you'll see the influence that he has upon people. See, we should be expecting good things to happen to us all the time with good intentions, with God's good intentions. Do you remember in Mark chapter 4 when the, when the disciples were with Jesus and they were out on the boat and they were crossing to the other side and Jesus was asleep in the hinder part of the ship, Right? And there came a great storm. The Amplified Bible says of hurricane proportions. So it's, it's a, 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 a serious storm. And the disciples are so freaked out that they're afraid that they're going to die. And they go wake Jesus up. And they said, now watch this. They said, Master, carest. In the Ampli, I, I, uh, the uh, King James says, carest. Carest thou not? Today we'd say, don't you care that we're going to die? Was that questioning his good intentions for them? If I come to you and I say, don't you care about me? Am I questioning your good intentions for me? Yes. So they were questioning Jesus' good intentions when he said this, when he got in the boat, he said, watch, let us go over to the other side. They didn't believe him. And then when the storm came and he's still asleep, they said, don't you care that we're going to die? So they're questioning that he has good intentions for them. He just doesn't care about us. He's going to let the storm come. He's going to let it just devour us. But did Jesus show his good intentions? First, he wanted them to do it. Because he's trying to teach them that they can do this. That they can speak to the storm and say, peace be still. But what does he do? He gets up and he says, peace be still. And, and there is a great calm. And then he looks at the disciples and he says, how is it that you're so fearful? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So now he's saying, you should have been the one doing that and let me rest. But he shows his good intentions. I love Romans 8, 28. It's one of my, I, have, I don't have a favorite, favorite verse, meaning like that's it, right there it is. That's my favorite verse. But I have like lots of favorite verses. That I, that I, you know, I always enjoy reading and, and I always enjoy hearing. Romans 8, 28 is one of my favorite verses because it says, and we know that all things work together for, for good to them that love God. So that means this. 
it might not look like it's a good situation. It might look like there's chaos. It might look like things are not going well. But he says, but all things work together. How many things? All things work together for, for good. Sometimes you just can't see it. But see, you're the representative of God, so you, you just have to, in the midst of the storm, you just have to say, I, listen, all, good, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. And I tell you right now, I'm a, I'm a Lord lover. Right? I, I love the Lord, so all things have to work together for good for me because either that or the Bible's not true. And I know the Bible is true. So since I love the Lord, all things work together for good. So something good is going to come out of this somehow, some way. This is the kind of messages that should come out of our churches. But we're coming into church sometimes and we're, we're focusing because we're getting a little bit too much of the world in us. And we're getting a little bit too much of the news in us. And we're getting a little bit too much of, well, this is what I would do in us. And rather than saying, well, wait just a minute, what would the Lord do? Well, what would the Lord have? What would he say? How would he respond to this? And if we get a little bit more of that in us, then we'll respond a little bit more like him. And then when people see that we're responding that way, it'll be an attraction to them because it is the bait that begins to lure them in the good they see the good in you and they see the good where the good is coming from and because unless you're taking the credit for yourself and say yeah I'm good and you know what I'm like you know really pretty something special <laughs> you know uh, I do I mean you know I'm an amazing person and I'm just uh, uh, everything I say is good and I mean if you want to take like that then people then that will repel people they'll go oh hmm yeah, I thought, I thought I saw something good in you, but yeah, I don't like that. But when, when they say, what is it about you? And you go, man, I'm just, I, I'm just super blessed. God just really loves me. He takes care of me. He opens doors for me when they seem to be no way. He, he, he does stuff that, I mean, like, I don't know. Maybe I might be a favorite. I don't know. <laughs> the reality of it is, is this, is we're all his favorites. And, and that's the way you ought to feel. Like, man, he, he looks at me and he just is in love with me. And so he wants to do something good for me. And then when that kind of expression comes out of you, they go, well, tell me about your church. Tell me about the God that you serve. Tell me about where all this has come from. You sure seem to be blessed. And see, they begin to see something in you because what's in you is coming from him. So all things work together. And then this is, one, this is one, of my top, one of my top five favorite verses. I'll say it like that. I love, love, love this verse. Romans 2, verse 4. I already said it, but let me read it again. He says, Do you despise the riches of His goodness and the forbearance and the long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, it's a question that he's asking the, the, the Roman church. He's saying, don't, essentially, don't you understand that it's the goodness of God that leads you to repent? The New Living Translation says it like this. Don't you see how wonderfully tolerant, kind and tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Don't you understand that the thing that God, that, that, that your relationship with him is all based on the fact that he wants something good for you. It's, it's goodness. When you see his goodness, it's what will turn you to him. Don't you understand how wonderfully kind that he is? This is what he's trying to tell us. And if we're going to represent God appropriately, that's what we have to see. That's what we have to project. We have to let people know, wait, man, it's, it's, it's all God. And everything about God, every part of God is good. Don't be afraid of God. No, you should run, run to God. So it comes back to us. Let me bring it back home just a little bit so I can kind of get to the place where I can wrap this up. Mark chapter 16, he tells us very specifically, Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's getting ready to leave, right? He's getting ready to go back to heaven but he wants to give some last instructions about what it is that your job is. So what is your job? Are you just here to take up space and take up some oxygen? Are you just here just so that you can experience all the good things that are possible to experience? Amazing vacations. 
Nothing wrong with amazing. We have had some amazing vacations. So there's, there's nothing wrong with amazing vacations. But if that's all you're living for, if that's your whole purpose in life, or to get the next latest, greatest technology toy, right? I mean, if this is the only reason that you're living, you, you, then it's all wrong. Nobody wants to follow that. I mean, people will go, well, that's great, but, you know, what's the big deal with that? So what's your purpose? What's your call? What is it that God wants us to do? He says in Mark 16, verse 15, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now remember, let's think about this one, one minute. Gospel means what? Good news, right? So when he says preach the gospel, then he's saying, remember what the word good means. Beautiful news. Cheerful news. News that will bring people at ease. Pleasant news. News that brings pleasure. Precious news. News of prosperity and sweet news. Bring that, he says, to people. Well, what exactly would do that? What would cause people to see it as beautiful, cheerful, bring them at ease, bring a, a, a pleasantness and pleasure and preciousness and prosperity and sweet? What kind of news would do that? When you come to the knowledge that you are lost as a person before you accept Christ, that you are lost and forever separated from your Creator, that there is no way back to that Creator except through one person. When you recognize your lost condition and that there is no, no way to achieve it, all throughout the Old Testament, they all tried this. They try to be as good as they could. They bring sacrifices. They bring offerings. They would try to live up to certain standards. And how many of you know, none of those were successful. People miserably failed. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all made the mistake. Nobody can say, I have just been, lived a perfect life. Some of you think that, but you haven't. You all have sinned. You all have come short of the glory of God. And we're all separated from God without the person of the Lord Jesus. That's what, when you have no hope and there's no way to achieve getting to that place and there's nothing that you could do to do it, but then somebody tells you there is one way. Only one way, in fact. But there is a way. What do you think that that brings with it, the news, that news? What does it bring with it? Is that beautiful news? You, 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 don't, you, can't get to, you can't get to heaven, man. You're lost. You can't make it. And then somebody says, but wait, but wait. There is one way, actually. One way, and that is what? If you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Is that beautiful news? Yes. Is that cheerful news? Would that put you at ease? Would it make you feel pleasant? And it, would it bring you pleasure? Would it feel precious to you? Would it make you feel prosperous? And would it be sweet? And I suspect that it would. I know that it has. Because there's a heaviness upon people that are not born again, whether they want to admit it again or not. They, you don't have to. It, it doesn't matter. I already know. Every unsaved person has a heaviness upon their shoulders, upon their mind, that, that causes them to be at odds. It does. I don't, I don't, you say, no, I'm living, I don't, I don't have that, and I'm not born again. You're lying. You say, you call me a liar? I sure did. On the inside of you, you know that something is missing. What else? What if you're sick? What if you're sick? What would, what, what would be good news to you? Would it be good news to you if you felt like there was no, there was no hope and there was no answer, there's, there's no way to achieve, uh, to bring yourself back to a, a state of health, a healthy condition? And, and then somebody came to you and they said, you know, uh, now that I think about it, the Bible said in Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse 17, that he took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses, and that applies to you. Would that seem like beautiful news to you? Would it be precious? And would that sound sweet to you? 
you have to be in that condition to actually answer that question because it's hard to imagine that until you're in that condition and to feel hopeless and feel like there's no answer but then all of a sudden you feel like there's no way but then somebody says wait just a minute there is, a, there is an answer that is good news that's what should be representing us that's what we should be doing as a church we should be encouraging people in the midst of all kinds of crap that's going on all around the world and stuff, chaos, and, and people just in a mess and doing all kinds of things, we have to stand out as just a little bit different. We have to be the ones that bring peace to the calm or bring peace to the storm and calm to the storm. We have to be the ones that stand up in the middle of all this stuff and say, wait, just a minute, there's good news. You don't have to do that. I know that I'm not saying necessarily go get in the middle of, you know, when somebody's trying to steal a TV out of a Target. I'm just like, I'm watching that and just shaking my head going, you, you're not helping this poor man for his memory. It does not help him. Let's focus on him and let's get him justice. And, and, then, and then let's hope that the man that did that will have an opportunity to repent. Because everybody wants to send people to hell that does. I mean, when you do that, they go, I hope you rot in hell. That sounds real godly. I, I know, I know, it's, I know it's hard. I know it's hard not to do that when, when somebody that is precious to you, I know that's difficult. But what do you think will draw people to God when they go, man, you're being too good. That's too good, that's too good for him. You ever heard that expression? Yeah, it is. It is too good for him. But that's the way God operates. Now, it doesn't mean there's not justice that is demanded. Justice is, is screaming out right now for this, for this gentleman. Their ha justice has to be served. But that doesn't mean that he can never be forgiven. And for us to think, man, I, I hope he rots in hell. I hope he dies and goes to hell. That is not, that, that's not God. That'll never lead. You talk that kind of talk and you'll, you'll cause people. To, oh, you know what they'll do? They'll jump in with you. That's right. That's right. You think that helps them see God? It doesn't. What about if you, you have, you're in a state of poverty or lack and you need help? What would be good news to you? Would it be good news to you to, to hear that though he was rich, he was made poor so that you might be made rich? And don't get hung up on that word rich. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, a billionaire. It just means more than enough. He had more than enough. Jesus had more than enough, but yet he was made poor so that you might be made to have more than enough. Be in the position to be able to be blessed and have enough that you not only can help you, but help somebody else as well. Isn't it a wonderful feeling to be a blessing? God wants to use you to help somebody else. And then there's periods of time that you might need help, and then you get through it, and then you're a blessing and a help to somebody else. This is the kind of good news stuff that we have to be, that has to represent our church. We have to be carriers, accurate carriers of the good news. We've got to be representatives of the Lord Jesus that when people see us, they just go, man, there's something about those people. There's something about that church. There's something about the way that they, what they believe. They're not condemning. They don't send me to hell. They're trying to get me to heaven trying to encourage me they they're giving me news that hey there is hope there's something for me there's if i'm sick there's a way out if i need uh you know something to, to be blessed with that god will help me he wants to help me this is the heart that god has everything god did remember let's just go back for just one moment in genesis chapter one what did he say after everything he looked at his creation and god said man that is good and he looked another time, he goes, that is good. And then to the last day, he says, wow, that is very good. And that included you. That included you being created. He looked at creation as a whole, and he said, that's good. Let's don't, let's don't change that message. And then he says, this is your call. This is your purpose. Go out and preach the gospel to everyone that'll hear it. Some people won't hear it. You know what I do with the people that won't hear it? I don't get per it's so invested normally. I'm not saying it hasn't been the case. But I don't get so invested like, you know, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my message for somebody else because I'm so focused on one. I'm like, either A, you're not ready to hear, or B, you don't want to hear. And either way, I just can't help you. But here's the thing. If I go out and I share that message enough, sooner or later I'm going to help somebody. Somebody's going to hear that and go, you know what, tell me a little bit more. And that's all you need is just a, just a little bit for them to go, just, what, now, what was that? Say that one more time. Say this one last thing. You remember when David was on the battlefield, he, brought, he had brought his brothers, they were getting ready to, uh, to uh, fight Goliath, or they were, they, I don't guess they would have fought him, they were being taunted by Goliath. And so David brings some, uh, some food to his brothers. Now he's already been anointed king, but he's not... He's not walked into that anointing yet. But he shows up at the battlefield and they said something like, uh, did you hear what's going to happen to the man that, that kills the giant? He'll be free from taxes. He'll get a big reward. And he's going to get the king's daughter. And you know what David said? David said, paraphrasing, you go back and read it and you'll see, paraphrasing David goes, would you say that one more time? It was just enough to entice him. He was like, what? I don't know which one he was more interested in. No taxes, a big reward, or the king's daughter. But either way, one or all were enticing to him. And that's what happens when we do good and speak good and proclaim good. We proclaim the message that God has given us. There's hope for it to be saved. There's hope to be healed. There's hope to be blessed. And you do that, what will happen is somebody will go, Now, say that one more time. What, what, what did you, now, what do you mean by that? That's all you need because now there's your opening. There's your door. And you begin to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads, please? Just for a moment.